Hello, Orcas Island. It's been said that the generation who grew up during World War II was the last generation to really know what the world their kids were going to grow up during. That technology, society, everything's changing so fast that we no longer know what it's like for our kids. Here's two pictures of two people that I love very dearly. The little one is my daughter. Isabel, she's one years old. The bigger one is my brother. He's 21. And they're 20 years apart, one generation. And what's interesting is, I kind of know what the world is going to be like over the next 20 years for my brother. You see, from an age of nine, because he's part of a very degenerate um, family, <laughs> he loved gambling. <laughs> And love playing poker, love playing poker with family, love playing poker with friends, love playing poker online, um, just love poker. And that grew a passion for numbers, statistics, probability. And so when Ian graduated high school, he got on a plane and flew to the middle of the country to Indiana University so he could study statistics. And Indiana University is around the same size as the University of Washington, so it's a big state school. And he'll graduate and then he'll get a job somewhere. And he'll go across the country again to some place where he can get a job, probably at some multinational data-driven corporation. And most likely, he will either live right next to where he works or he'll commute. You know, this is pretty much what the world that he's gonna grow up in is like. But when I look at Isabel and when I think about my daughter, I think her world is gonna be very different, even if it has a lot of similarities. You see, I think she's going to also grow up in a generic family. <laughs> it's embarrassing. But, you know, she'll graduate high school and she'll go to university. But her university is going to be different. She's going to go to a university that doesn't exist yet, and it, that has some of the best professors. It will have over a million students all over the world, South America, North America, Africa, Asia, Europe. And she'll then graduate, but she won't travel for her job. She won't travel to a job. She'll pick the place she wants to live based on family or friends or lifestyle. And she won't have to work in a cube or commute. See, the difference between the world that Isabel's growing up in and the world that Ian's growing up in is virtual reality. I know, it sounds crazy, virtual reality. I'll we'll give you a history on virtual reality before I start talking about why I think that's going to change things. The term and the idea was first coined in the 50s. It was, oh, okay, well, we can project these things around us and go to some other magical place. But it took a while for the technology to ever really do anything. And then even like the 60s and the 70s, you started to have universities where they could invest some money and time and energy into trying to create these simulations. And it was okay. You know, um, come into the, the, the 80s and 90s, it started to get some really cool stuff. But nothing that was accessible to the consumer. You know, n most people couldn't experience a, this virtual reality thing. So about two years ago, this self-professed VR nerd kid, who was a teenager at the time, had this idea. What if we strap a couple iPhones to our eyes? Seriously, I'm not joking. Like, what you, like, will that work? But he you know, was 19 years old, needed some money, ran a Kickstarter, tried to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars, raised millions. Then a bunch of venture capitalists, as they are wont to do, got all like rrr, hungry, invested a bunch more millions of dollars into the company. And then within two years, earlier this year, Facebook acquired that company, Oculus, for $2 billion. And he didn't do it just because, oh, VR is this thing in the future. It was that it was now becoming accessible. You know, there's multiple companies who will have consumer virtual reality devices available by the end of next year. And when I talk about what virtual reality is, it's not just, oh, I can go experience dinosaurs or go on our planet. 
but I can separate my physical location from where I am present, and that's going to be powerful. But again, I'm talking like just, just 20 years to a fundamental change in our society. Let's talk about what the world was like 20 years ago. Who remembers cell phones back then? They were like briefcases. You're like, hey, I can't talk right now. I'm limping because this is so heavy. Like, I don't even think they had the time on them. <laughs> and now we take for granted that we have what is essentially the sum of all human knowledge available in our pockets. We take for granted that we can call pretty much anyone anywhere in the world in our pockets. Like our world has shrunk to an extent and the information that we have in just 20 years that we, we don't even, it's hard to even remember what it was like to have to like make plans with people. Like, okay, I'll, I'll meet you at this place at this time and then you're like, oh, they're 30 minutes late, what do I do? You know, we don't even schedule things anymore. Say, hey, let's go to the bar, okay, cool. What bar are you at? And you're just texting, it's incredible. It's made a pretty big change. But let's talk about some previous big changes that we've had, some other, other times a society has made a fundamental shift. The first time where our society really changed how we work was the agricultural revolution. Before that, we were hunter-gatherers. And it was basically, it took about 100% of the people to keep society fed. You know, you had people taking care of kids, and you had people taking care of older people and the rest of the people were getting food for those people. We were pretty inefficient. And at some point, someone said, let's plant some seeds in the ground. Let's see if we can master um, the berries and the plants. And sure enough, society got this great efficiency. Now it took fewer people to be able to feed a greater number of people. And this did all kinds of cool things. This really changed our, our world and changed our society. Now we started to have urban density around these farming centers. Um, now people had a little more time. But this agricultural revolution, this change, also it, it had the ceiling. It created some challenges. It created difficulties. And then the solution to those difficulties were something only the agricultural revolution could have provided. And it provided technologies that live with us today, that we use every day. And that's writing and arithmetic. Like we don't think about writing and arithmetic it's like, oh, thank goodness we planted some grain in the ground. Thanks, guys. But it's true. Like, they, they had to keep track of the grain. They had to keep track of the population. And that allowed people more time to solve those problems. So we had writing and arithmetic. It was incredible. The next big revolution we had, or another big revolution, was the Industrial Revolution. Right? This also fundamentally changed things. It wasn't about feeding people anymore. We kind of had that dialed down. This was about producing stuff. Right? No longer was it one person or two people working on a chair or a piece of clothing. All of a sudden, we could start producing more and more goods. We gained this huge efficiency. But that also started to run into some problems, run into some issues. And similarly, those issues were things only that could have, the, the efficiency gain could have solved. See, if you owned a factory back then or you owned a, a textile mill, you started to realize like, oh man, I, I need to share the knowledge and I need to train people and man, these things are complicated and I need people to be better at problem solving. And it was through that efficiency and that problem that we developed the need for universal education. Right? So in both cases, we had this great efficiency that we had developed as a society, but that had limits and problems and needed solutions and that those actual technologies that we had helped us provide the solution. And we're in a similar revolution now. We're in the middle of it. So close to the middle of it, we barely even notice it, but it's the information revolution. Things are crazy. Like, it's, I mean, like we've gained huge efficiencies. We've got the ability to telecommute now. We've got all these different things, but it's driving us crazy. Like, how many times have you been out at a restaurant and you're talking to someone, they're on their phone? Or worse, how many times have you been out at a restaurant and someone's talking to you and you've been on your phone? Right? How much stress is there about the fact that um, uh, you're always on an email, that at any point someone can contact you? But it's great, it's powerful, wouldn't take it back. 
We're glad it's there. But then we're still like stuck with these other limitations in our society. Like I can't count how many times I've flown to San Francisco just for a one meeting or one dinner. Like that's an, just this huge burden. It's taxing on me, it's taxing on my family, it's taxing on the environment, but yet that's, we still have to do that. Well, when I think about the information age, I think about virtual reality is gonna be the thing to, to let off that pressure valve. You see, once we unlock the ability to disconnect our location from our presence, it will change everything. And when I'm talking about what virtual reality is like, I wanna just paint a picture for everyone really quick so everyone is with me. I'm not talking about uh, teenagers in their basement in their underwear drinking sodas and playing video games. Like, that's not what it's gonna be like. Look around. Just look around right now at each other. Why are we here? We're here because we're a community. And we're here because we can be present with each other. If you guys wanted to watch his YouTube videos, you could do, there's thousands of TEDx YouTube videos to have, but there's power in coming together and experiencing something. When I talk about virtuality, it's gonna be like this. It's gonna feel like you're with people. It's gonna feel like they're there next to you watching something. It's gonna feel like they're there with you, making eye contact, being present. So if I want the value from that presence, I won't have to get on a plane. I'll be able to do that for my own workspace. It's challenging sometimes for me to think about the world that Isabel's gonna grow up in and to think, well, it's gonna be kind of weird. You know, I don't really know exactly what it's gonna be like. But I think about a world where my daughter, she doesn't have to travel unless it's for self-enrichment or adventure. When I think about a world where she can get the best education and there's so many teachers available to her that if she wants to learn a subject, she can go to a teacher who teaches it in a way where she can be more receptive. I want my daughter to grow up into a world where she doesn't have to commute to go to work. I want my daughter to live in a world where she doesn't have to work in a cube that stifles creativity and energy, where she can choose to be by friends and family, where she can get efficiency from this world and from the information age so she can spend more time being healthy and being present with other people. I think that's gonna be a really great world. And when I think about it, what it's gonna unlock for her, right? If virtual reality can finally unlock communication, collaboration, and empathy from the information age, things that we are so desperately yearning for, that will be powerful. You know, the, the neuroscientists of today talk about the secret to happiness, and before them, the authors and writers, and before them, the philosophers, and before them, the prophets, you know, all the way back to Plato and Socrates. We've had that secret to happiness. We've had the secret to life. It's be present with each other, love each other, forgive each other, listen to each other, be empathetic. These are not secrets that we don't know about. They're secrets we all have, and this idea that there's a technology that will be able to make the world smaller, that will be able to make things easier for us to experience things like empathy, I think is gonna be a wonderful world for my daughter to grow up in. Thank you.